stormtroopers hope everybody is well i'm just finishing off my cup of timmy's here uh tim horton coffee that was uh, graciously sent to me from canada and today i thought i would make good on my uh promise to talk about the b-26 now this is not going to be a history of the airplane you can read about that and Wikipedia. We're just going to discuss the airplane. Now this model is the Ravel Monogram 148 scale. I was out here dusting it off. I think must have had a pound of dust on it. been on the shelf for so long. I want to talk about this model and then we'll talk about the airplane. First off, this is a great model. It was originally a monogram kit and all that that implies. The good detail, great interior detail, all that stuff. Which I did not put in it because I knew I was making this for the camera. So I had to cut it I uh, had to put a generic markings on it, put it in coat everything in dull coat to prevent uh, uh, chroma key spill. Um, so I didn't bother to really detail the interior because I knew you weren't going to be able to see it. I tried to modify it. This is a later model. Uh, I think this is, I believe this is a D model. Um, and uh, I tried to trim down the carb intakes and everything and just I didn't trim the wings off because I, I, you were going to see it from an angle where you could tell. Um, I tried to put some faux spinners on it, but they don't really look like the spinners of the proper model. So, but the kit itself, everything fit well. It's really, it's really a good kit. I, I was impressed with it. Um, it kind of sad that it had to do this kind of hatchet job on it, but not, not a problem. Um, and the irony is, is even so when I put it up on the shelf, you know, cause I have it way up on a shelf, it still looks good. So let's talk about the uh, b26 the airplane all right most of you guys are probably familiar but for just for the sake of those who aren't now there are two b26s and it gets confusing so let me keep this simple in world war ii there was the martin b26 marauder this airplane and the douglas a26 invader at the end of world war ii all of the b26 marauders were retired destroyed gotten rid of they were out of the inventory in the united states then the air force changed the way it named aircraft and the a26 invader was redesignated the b26 invader so when you say b26 you got to be careful marauder invader two completely different airplanes completely different companies all right with that chore out of the way one other thing this was made by martin aircraft glenn l martin for some reason i seem to occasionally mistakenly say Glenn Curtis, totally different company, Curtis Aircraft, who made, you know, the P-40s. Please, if I say Glenn Curtis in this video, I mean Glenn L. Martin. I'll try to catch that. This is like my fourth retake because I caught myself doing that. Anyway, so on with the airplane. The B-26 Marauder is a pre-war design. It was around at the beginning of the war. They fought at the Battle of Midway. They were very fast, and they were sort of exactly what the Air Force had asked for. Now, the Air Force wanted a fast medium bomber, and this plane delivered. But like everything in aviation, it comes at a cost. There's a trade-off. The airplane had a lot of issues, which the early airplanes of any type almost invariably do. To begin with, this was still the age where you got speed through big powerful engines on the lightest, most cleanest airframe you could get. You have to remember this airplane was made only a few years after the GB was the world record setter. They're, they're, not, they're not separated by that much time. In fact, these are both 148 scale. <laughs> Just to give you a little uh, comparison there. Um, oh, GB, this airplane still terrifies me just to look at. Jimmy Doolittle, you are a man among men. Now, speaking of Doolittle, there's one thing I need to point out. The B-26, was the early ones especially, were such a handful, especially on one engine, that there were a lot of pilots that believed that you simply could not fly the airplane on one engine. And Jimmy Doolittle, who had made himself famous, amongst other things, for his flying in the GB, was the Air Force's go-to man to dispel that myth. So he went around giving demonstrations of the B-26 on one engine. It got so bad that at one point the Army Air Corps got a bunch of, or Army Air Force got a bunch of women's air service pilots, the WASPs, 
the ladies that were flying for the military to they checked them out in B-26s and have them go around giving demonstrations of the airplane basically to shame the guys and to just quit whining and fly the airplane but the airplane did have some serious serious issues uh, there were runaway props with the electric propellers they had had a notoriously weak landing gear locking mechanism a lot of gear failures um, uh, Martin kind of tried to say that well they're pranging them too hard but some of them collapsed while they were taxing so it, that was something that had to be addressed but those weren't the really dangerous thing the really dangerous thing was the short wings and the small tail it just made the, this airplane came over the fence 120 130 miles an hour there were also in the early models especially the ones that were made before the rear turret was ready there were also some weight and balance issues that were not to be scoffed at so the airplane definitely had a tough teething process but in return of that you got a bomber that could outrun a lot of fighters um not the later ones but uh, you know you weren't gonna run a zero with it but you could slow his closure rate to the point that your gunners could get a good beat on him which by the way did happen in midway um the the airplane was uh had a lot of potential but it definitely had to have the the bugs worked out of in fact it had such a high accident rate at one point they shut down the production line until they could look at it in a 30-day period they lost 15 of them and they put i believe it was another 13 in one year in tampa bay just so yeah they really were losing way too many of them um low time pilots even the instructors in many cases weren't that experienced on the airplane and it was not a particularly user-friendly airplane in some ways there's a, there's a video uh, an old training film on the B-26 that was made, and I believe it was made much later in the war, um, that if I can find it, I'll link it below, but it gets into how like things like transferring fuel and stuff and keeping everything back. It could be a trick. So the airplane definitely has gotchas, but you were pushing a lot of new technologies. You were pushing the very edge of bomber performance. And of course, as a result of the high speed and everything, the airplane had a very high combat survivability rate, but then of course that's compensated for by extremely high accident rate. Nomenclature on the airplane gets kind of confusing because you know, first off it's made in two locations. They were made I believe in Baltimore and I believe also in Oklahoma and they had a different designation for the ones that were made in different places. Um, I think the B's were made in Baltimore and the C's were made in Oklahoma. If I've got that wrong I'll put a factoid over my head or across my face. But one thing that also uh, caused it's kind of one of the more famous stories is that uh, the, what was often called the Truman Commission, which was overseeing fraud, waste, and abuse in military contracts, uh, actually got a, a, focused a lot on the B-26. And apparently, the way the story goes is that uh, Harry Truman, who was, a, a I believe, a senator at this point, um... I don't think he was vice president yet, uh, goes to the Martin plant, meets Glenn L. Martin. They talk about why that acts, what the acts, what's causing the accident rate. Martin tells him, well, the wings are too short, the tail's a little too small. He says, well, why don't you change the design? And according to Truman, the way he tells the story is Martin saying that, nope, I've got a contract. It's too late in the development process. It'll hold up production. We're just going to have to make them the way they are. The boys are going to have to learn to fly them. And Truman hits the ceiling and says, uh, no, you can't do that. you got to fix them. Well, I've got a contract. Well, I'll cancel that contract. Well, fine. If you're going to cancel the contract, I'll fix it. And Truman paints himself as the hero that fixed the B-26 by forcing Martin to make the corrections. No one I know of who's ever written about this or worked at uh, Martin Aircraft buys that version of the story because apparently Glenn L. Martin was a great guy to work for. He really cared about people. Not the kind of man to send people off to war in a, an airplane that he knew was defective. So for this next segment, this is all supposition in my reading of the tea leaves, because to my knowledge, uh, Martin never really discussed this and it's not brought up in his biography. So first off, did this meeting occur? Yeah, I, I think it did because uh, apparently there was antagonism between uh, Martin and uh, Truman all the way through Truman's presidency. And uh, although apparently Truman, as I understand it, didn't, I'm, I, some people say that when he was interviewed and talked about this, it was several years after Glenn L. Martin had already passed away and wasn't around to defend himself. But I don't know if this is just uh, Truman's 
perspective on it or if he's embellishing the story. God, I mean, a politician embellishes a story to make himself look good. What are the odds? But what I think probably happened was Martin is on the airplane to do what the uh, Air Force said they wanted it to do. And they didn't realize this thoroughbred airplane was going to be a little more than a lot of their pilots could handle. But the fixes were going to slow production. Everyone knew the war clouds were, were, were beating and very possibly that the Air Force said, look, we can't take the delay. Just keep making the planes. Martin probably was just given the Air Force what they asked for, even though the engineers knew the changes needed to be made. And, and, and changes were being made throughout the production of the aircraft, like most aircraft. Uh, then uh, Truman comes along. Martin probably tells him, look, this is the contract. This is what they want. And then Truman's like, no, you got to change it or else. I just can't see Martin. The, the way Truman portrays it is that he's completely insensitive to the needs of the, of the aviators out there in the field. It just doesn't sound like the Glenn Martin, everybody I know who worked at Martin talks about. Now, I could be wrong. Uh, so it's all supposition on my part, but I just have the feeling, and it's nothing more than that, that uh, the former president is making a bit of an embellishment, but I don't want to besmirch him because it may very well be that it happened exactly the way he said he did. So you have to decide that for yourself. Um, like I say, uh, Martin never discusses it. Truman brags about it. My guess is the truth is somewhere in the middle. It's also the countervailing point that Martin never mentions it because he's ashamed of it and that maybe it is true. I don't know. It just seems a little, I don't, want to, I don't know if I want to say contrived, but you see what I'm saying? But anyway, the plane did get the wings and tail extended, which helped. And also I should add that, uh, just to add a little confusion, you would think with longer wings and a taller tail, I think they added three, roughly three feet to each wing and about a foot to the tail. You would think that it would get an entirely new uh, subtype number, like uh, you know the B26D or something, but it didn't. They just made it, I believe it was the B26B-10, and there were like six different versions of the B model. So I, I couldn't find anything else about that controversy. I would personally like to know if... Uh, Martin was really willing to field an airplane he knew was deficient or if he was just under pressure of the Air Corps to make deliveries and um, uh, maybe Truman gave him an out. But it, le it led to a, a, a rift between the two that extended well after the war. In fact, when Truman was president, he went out of his way to make sure Martin didn't get any contracts in the military. And um, the, uh, the um, Martin company, though, despite Truman's best efforts, managed to survive. And actually, Lockheed Martin, they're still around today. You know, when you think of modern aircraft, Martin is not the first thing that pops in the mind. It's usually a Boeing or Lockheed, maybe Grumman. Um, and uh, in World War II, when you talk about aircraft, it, you know, the first thing that pops in your head is usually something like, you know, North American. Um, but Martin's been there the whole time. They were around before World War II, and they're still around today. So, you know, props to them for surviving. But back to the B-26. Um, towards the end of the war, they'd gotten most of the bugs worked out of it. It was always a handful of airplane. But there aren't there are only about eight of them left in museums, and only one that's Kermit Weeks, which is in potential flying condition. Ironically, Kermit actually has the early model with the spinner and the, and the small slit uh, air intakes on top of the cowling. That's the model that was used at Midway. Uh, I somehow I doubt that plane's ever going to fly again. Um, aside from being hard to get parts, it's the last one that's potentially flyable condition. It would just, it would be such a crying shame if anything happened to it. But I have seen the airplane and walked around it. It's a, it, it's a intimidating machine. You kind of look at it, it just sort of goes fast sitting there. The cigar shape is extremely aerodynamic. You know, this is the same way the Japanese designed the Betty Bomber. And, uh, it, it gives it a little bit of a portly or tubby look, but it's actually a very aerodynamically clean design. Um, the airplane doesn't go fast enough for the area rule principle to come into effect. So the fact that the wings mount is where the fuselage is bald, this really isn't an issue. Um, you look at it, it's much cleaner than a B-25. So uh, the uh, next thing is 
what happened to the airplanes at the end of the war. Well, although the airplane was considered obsolete at the end of the war because everyone knew jets were the future, and because of its tricky handling characteristics, the Air Force decided at the end of the war, we don't need these airplanes, we're just going to get rid of them. But unlike a lot of our other aircraft that a lot were saved, there were concerns. Now, we'd given some of them to other air forces, but we didn't want to risk these things falling into the wrong hands because despite their quirks, they were still a viable, effective, and potentially dangerous uh, adversary if they should fall into the wrong hands. They weren't worth the expense of bringing them back to the United States. And if I can find the footage of this, I'll put it below, and it'll be enough to make you weep. But at the end of the war, the American B-26s were blown up in place, in situ. Uh, I think it was the Army Corps of Engineers was sent out with explosives. They packed the cockpit of each one of them with explosives, and kaboom. And that was to keep anybody else from getting them. Because, like I say, if, if an adversary was to get them... They, they, they were still enough of an airplane to be a potential threat, and we really didn't have any use for them anymore. The uh, handful that survived, uh, a couple of them were converted into executive transports. Uh, the Confederate Air Force actually got one of those planes, converted it back to its military configuration, but they lost it in the 90s. They also lost uh, the last flying A-20, which has, th there's a big rift between what's now, the, used to be the Confederate Air Force, now it's the Commemorative Air Force, and a lot of the museums, a lot of the museums think you guys are out there flying these vintage, occasionally one-of-a-kind airplanes, risking them and occasionally destroying them. And, of course, the commemorative Air Force people are like, yeah, but your airplanes just sit there inert just for people to look at. You don't hear the noise or see them fly. So both have arguments. I'm not going to take a side on that one. Um, but uh, the B-26, definitely a controversial airplane. If you could survive the training program and get into combat, it probably had the best chance of bringing you home. But uh, the accident rate and the problems of the early airplanes cannot be ignored. And it still had some gotchas all the way up until they retired them. But man, it delivered. It gave the Air Force exactly what they asked for. Fast, capable airplane. But the airplane was, uh, if I'm not mistaken, the airplane also believed that bombed Monte Cassino. The, um, <laughs> they didn't realize that the Germans were actually outside the, <laughs> the monastery, not in it. <laughs> and... <laughs> So there went, uh, you know, I mean, not the airplane's fault, but uh, they were used in the Pacific some. Uh, I think they were gone out of the Pacific by 44, but they really, really did most of their flying in the Mediterranean and in uh, the European theater. And they were a force to be reckoned with. It was a thoroughbred. And uh, like any thoroughbred, you got to show it, you got to show it who's in charge, but you got to show it some respect. And uh, still a controversial airplane. Not to mention a little confusing because of the whole B-26 Marauder, B-26 Invader deal. So again, you have to be specific. But uh, it's it's an airplane that, uh, well, a lot of aviation buffs, they, they, they like uh, the more famous planes, the B-17s, the B-25s. The Marauder kind of slides in there a lot of times almost as a footnote, but uh, it's... It's an airplane that gets overlooked a lot. I don't think it gets enough love. And I would personally like to know what the real deal was with Glenn L. Martin and uh, Truman and the whole, you know, Marauder scandal. But uh, in the end, it delivered. And was it a great plane? Well, you've got to decide that for yourself. But uh, I'm inclined to think it deserves that name. If nothing else, it set the standard for performance. In fact, a lot of civilian aircraft still use this plan for them. Aerostar, Air Commander, you know, the high wing or shoulder wing or mid wing mounted uh, uh, big engine uh, platform, high speed wing platform, uh, is stayed popular. I mean, the A26 Invader, which is a later design, uh, considered a better flying airplane. And, and indeed, it was a later design with more modern uh, aerodynamics and everything. So I don't fault the uh, Air Force for retiring to the B-26 Marauder as soon as they could and replacing it with the A-26, which again later became the B-26. But I think the Marauder tends to get short shrift. It was there for the entire war. We had them 
uh, before the war. We had them right up to the end of the war. And uh, pretty much they were where the shooting was at. Well, guys, that's it uh, for today. I just thought uh, you guys want to talk about the B-26, so uh, we talk about it. And now that I've got this thing dusted off, it goes back up on the shelf. You have a wonderful day, and model on. <laughs>